So I'm sitting here uh, reflecting on the fact that tomorrow is my first day of my first full proper semester of my PhD. And of course I'm restless, my mind's racing, and I've been thinking more about some of the stuff that I mentioned in a post the other day about how I was sitting in my living room um, on a Sunday night, I believe it was, uh, talking to myself, or almost lecturing to myself about some of the things that I would say if I were teaching an exercise physiology class. And um, I don't know, I just felt like sharing some of my thoughts because I was restless anyway, and maybe some other people might get something out of this. I don't know. But um, there are a couple of major reasons why I love exercise physiology so much. The first one owes to my undergraduate exercise physiology professor. His name is Dr. David Ballar. He teaches at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. That's where I got my bachelor's degree. And he, um, you know, brilliant guy. And he was tough, really tough. And I owe him for that. I'm thankful that he was, he, that he held us to such high standards and for those of you who followed my personal life or any of the updates I've given and some of the ways I've opened up a little bit, you may recall that uh, in early 2011, my dad died. And it was a big deal. It was really rough. I'm still dealing with it on a number of levels. But appropriately, fittingly, whatever, that exercise physiology course was by many people like the most dreaded course. It was super hard. And that's the course... I had to take one of the courses I had to take the spring semester immediately following my dad's death. So I was dealing with all the personal stuff, the emotional stuff, the, the business end of things as far as inheriting the estate right after he passed away. And then I had to deal with this monster of a class that I really wasn't prepared for. And so it had a big impact on me because Dr. Ballard, to his credit, um, held me to a high standard, held us all to high standards, and was really... You know, he was, he was tough on us, while at the same time being generous with me where needed so, you know, I could get through it because I was struggling with a lot of stuff. And uh, I think he handled that in a way that uh, not a lot of people would have handled it. So I, I have insane respect for him for doing that. And the course he taught was very difficult. The tests were really hard. Um, he expected us to be adults in there and to push ourselves. And at the end of the semester, even though I struggled just to get a B, um, I came out knowing a lot more than I think a lot of people did, a lot of people do, at the end of an undergraduate ex -vis course. So I think it prepared me really well, and it made me respect it also. Prior to that course, I had been able to walk through almost effortlessly every kinesiology class or every exercise science class I took, whether it was anatomical kinesiology or biomechanics or um, you know, basic principles of training or sport ergogenics or anything, you know, I got A's easily. This course, exercise physiology, messed me up. It beat me up. And something about that had an effect. It, it made me respect it. And I couldn't shake this idea that I am not satisfied by the f fact that I only got a B in there. So that stuck with me. That was a big part of the whole thing. And, um, you know, actually also a lot of my professionalism or my dedication towards holding myself and others in the field of exercise and fitness to a really high standard comes from Dr. Ballard's influence. He had a deep, has a deep um, commitment to uh, pushing us to be good professionals. And that's a big deal. It, it made a big mark on me, so I owe a lot of that to him. A lot of that influence came from him. So uh, I haven't really given him a public shout out, but there you go. He's, he was great and continues to do great work. And, um, you know, he's really an asset to uh, my old school where I did my undergraduate degree, uh, Un University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Anyway, uh, so that was a big part, no, though. That was part one. That's kind of how it started, my interest in exercise physiology. And then after that, I kind of piggybacked off of that. When I revisited the course after I graduated, I started tutoring in it, started doing study groups, and that's where I kind of got the bug to teach. That was before I started my master's. And that brings me to part two. The other major reason why I love exercise physiology um, is partly influenced by uh, the, my exercise physiology professor at the master's level, a guy named Dr. John Quindry, who is a faculty member at Auburn. 
he taught X -Phys, advanced X Phys one and two to me uh, while I was there, and um, he gave me a lot of great advice on a number of topics. He's actually the guy who told me I would never wish a PhD on anybody who didn't deserve it or anybody who didn't want it. Excuse me. I wouldn't wish a PhD on anybody who doesn't want it because he realized he was acknowledging that it's a masochistic pursuit. You kind of have to be a glutton for punishment in order to want to go through a PhD. It's not easy. So that you know made a lot of sense to me and I, I definitely see that. It's not something you pursue just for fun. You don't get a PhD just because you're bored. You do it because you have a passion for something and you see a very serious payoff or you see a very, there's a deep reason for doing it. You have a, a compulsion to do it or a great drive for it. Um, so that was a big deal. But anyway, when he started teaching exercise physiology, he said some things that rubbed off on me, and I completely agree with them. And to give this little context, he was comparing exercise physiology to normal anatomy and physiology as it's taught in most undergraduate biology uh, curricula, most courses. Most people, at least in my experience in my old school and in schools I've been to, to take exercise physiology you need as a prerequisite or at least as a co-requisite to take uh, anatomy and physiology in you know the biology department and for people who've studied that anatomy and physiology well, what are those terms we've heard them tossed around and the kind of dime store definition is that anatomy is the study of structure physiology is the study of function and this is very true now when you investigate it a little closer you realize pretty quickly that you can't really separate one from the other structure will dictate function you know, the, the way my shoulder joint or my knee joint is built will determine how that joint moves and how it cannot move under normal circumstances. So the structure is going to affect the function of the joint. But then in human body, in many biological systems, it feeds back the other way as well. The, the function, the way you use it anyway, the way that function manifests and it, when we have voluntary control, the way we choose to use those functions can influence the form. That's exactly what we're trying to do with exercise. We're trying to influence the body to change, the form to change in many cases. We want to grow uh, our muscles to a larger size. We want to increase bone density. We want to increase um, maybe the presence of certain, um, the expression of certain enzymes, metabolic enzymes, whatever. We want to change neuromuscular function by changing maybe um, co neural connections. These are plastic changes we are trying to create in our body, some structural changes, and, and at least some capacity they are structural. And we are trying to create those changes by influencing the body to change. And we do that by using the functions our body gives us. So it's kind of cool to see how it feeds forward and it feeds back. So it's really a cycle. That's really cool to me. And so that brings me to why I think exercise physiology is really cool. In normal anatomy and physiology, typically, generally, there are exceptions to this, but in my experience, you see that you learn about homeostasis. Homeostasis being the body's innate drive to maintain a certain sort of equilibrium. You have a set point, right? A physiologic set point. And your body kind of has these minor oscillations back and forth around that. If it gets too far in one direction, it kind of comes back down. It goes too far in the other right, you know, direction, comes back up. If you're sitting down not doing anything, your heart rate will pretty quickly, should pretty quickly uh, kind of balance out and maintain a relatively stable level. Same thing for your blood pressure, same thing for the presence of metabolic enzymes in your muscles, same thing for a lot of stuff. These functions kind of have a, a comfortable range they stay in. And in my experience with anatomy and physiology, we learn what those normal levels are, we learn what normal blood pressure is, we learn what um, you know, a normal heart rate is, we learn what normal breathing rates are, etc. And we kind of just kind of, we get a snapshot there and we call it a day. Well, what Dr. Quindry mentioned when he was explaining exercise physiology, uh, at least his interpretation, and I thought this was brilliant, and I, I've borrowed it since then, is this. Exercise physiology gets to do the exciting stuff. Instead of just looking at what happens right around the mid-range, we get to explore the peaks and the valleys. We get to explore what happens when the body's homeostasis is challenged, when we yank it really far in one direction or shove it really far in the other. What happens when we force the body to jack up the heart rate really high? 
or when we challenge blood pressure, or when we push muscle output, force output to the absolute max, what happens? What's the body do to respond to that? So you could think of exercise physiology as a study of the body's response to these stimuli, or the study of the body's response to disturbances, disruptions in homeostasis. We get to study what happens when we rock the boat, when we mess with stuff. And this could be muscle force output, it could be and that could be absolute force, or it could be just repeated bouts of higher energy output and what happens metabolically. Um, be what happens to the nervous system and its behavior when we fatigue it or when we challenge it. It can be heat stress. There are people that dedicate their entire careers. One of the most brilliant, well-known uh, thermal exercise physiologists out there is uh, uh, Dr. Pasco, who also teaches at Auburn. I had the, the pleasure of learning under um, heat stress, cold stress, all these different stresses to the body. So we get to see what happens when we poke and prod and push the body and give it challenges, give it insults, give it some sort of disturbance when we shake it up. So I don't know, that to me is really cool. Exercise physiology is homeostasis challenged. If you want to make it a one kind of sentence, one line answer, I think that would be a great little test question I would give my students. You know, sum it up. What is it? So, of course, I'm biased, but I just think it's really cool. We in the field get to study that, how the body responds to all kinds of different things that life can throw at it, stuff that we can throw at it. And we get to, in so doing, admire the amazing complexity and robustness of the human body. We get to understand, we get to learn about all the different ways the body can manage these things and, and the different strategies it has to adapt to change, to it, you know. And that's a cool thing too. We get these acute responses like increases in blood pressure, right? And that's a funny thing. You'll exercise and your heart rate will go up and your blood pressure will go up and if you're doing an endurance exercise, you'll notice certain changes you can probably expect. Acutely, they go up, but then because the body tries to adapt in such a way that that challenge you gave it is not as much of a challenge to homeostasis the next time. Over time, you get these chronic adaptations that occur that then will actually, for the same level of exercise, for the same in absolute intensity, the challenge to the body goes down. And you'll often notice that the heart rate doesn't go up as high or the blood pressure maybe doesn't spike as much, depending on the situation. And your resting heart rate will change. So your resting homeostasis can change based on these exercise-based or exercise-induced acute, you know, temporary changes to the system or challenges to the system. So maybe that's really nerdy. Maybe nobody else kind of thinks that's cool, but I think that's amazing, you know. So I just wanted to share this, I guess. I, I was just thinking about it. And, um, yeah, you know, this, these are sort of things that have got me excited. And when I sit back and reflect on how powerful the body's suite of adaptations or responses really is, I think that's, you know, it's just incredible. It's mind-blowing to me that the body is able to manage so many different stresses, like I said, whether it's heat or cold or uh, increased, you know, energy output or force output or damage even, injuries, right? Whether it's a spinal cord injury or a broken bone or any of these things, you know, watching how it responds to these to these different stresses and stimuli. So it's a very dynamic thing. To me, it's a very living, organic kind of process we get to observe. We get to have a lot of fun. And uh, that's what got me excited about exercise physiology. That's why it was my major at the master level. That's why it's still my basic area of focus. Um, and that's hopefully why uh, I would get excited about it if or when I ever get around to teaching it myself. So there you go. I mean, this has gotten long and rambly. It's almost 15 minutes here. So if you stuck around this long, you're amazing. Um, just had some, like I said, last minute rambly thoughts because uh, I'm restless. My brain's going a mile a minute because I'm actually going and taking uh, advanced X phys again here at UT for a number of reasons I won't get into. And I'm okay with that. Um, I'm getting to revisit the course. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to mentor the master students and the other students, even doctoral level, if they're struggling with it, setting up study groups and, and discussions on research and all kinds of cool stuff, um, again, to help grow and develop myself as a, as a teacher, as a future professor and a scholar. 
and also just help them out and kind of promote some connectivity or cohesion with everybody. And I get to sit through the class again. It's like visiting an old friend. It's not a waste of time at all. So um, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot more out of it that I didn't get the first time I took graduate level XFIS. And uh, yeah, it's just really cool. So thanks for watching if you watched. Thanks for all the support to everybody out there who is letting me through their, whether it's monitor, monetary donations or words of support or words of advice or anything, um, helping me to pursue my nerdy dream of doing all of this. So there you have it. I'm going to try to calm down and get some rest tonight eventually, but uh, I think I got a little bit more reading to do before I'm satisfied. So good night.